Well, good morning, everyone. Let's um, turn to the Gospel of John. I had been away for a week, although I hear that there was a, um, a pre-recorded video sermon. I've heard from a couple people that that went okay. Any feedback that you want to give me on that would be very welcome. I didn't like the blurred background. Your voice is different when you're talking on a camera. Anything like that would be helpful uh, for next time. I do plan to be out of town a couple of times uh, again in the rest of the spring and summer. And if that worked okay, we'll, we'll try and do that again uh, next time I'm gone. But I want to continue with John chapter 8 and uh, go through the, uh, the next little chunk of the scriptures. So maybe I could have somebody volunteer to read a text from the passage for today. I have a reader, a volunteer reader. Give me this verse. Rick? I will read. All right, let's hear it. Just, Jeff, just verse 12. Just 12. Yep. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Great. Great. So this is a, uh, one of the most famous verses in the New Testament. Of course, there are many things to say about it. But the first thing I want to do is mention that it is the opening salvo in a long, long discourse by Jesus. In fact, we call it the light of the world discourse. And he goes on for the rest of chapter 8 without taking a breath after saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so I want to break down the light of the world discourse into two or maybe three messages. We're going to be talking about this for the next couple of weeks. And it's all going to go under the heading of, I am the light of the world. And I want to figure out what it is that Jesus means by, I am the light of the world. And what he means by following him and not walking in darkness, but in having the light of life. And I want, to, I want to figure out what it is that he's saying to 21st century Christians when he says that. And we're going to do that, of course, by figuring out what he's saying to 1st century Christians in the context of the actual historical dialogue that we have in front of us. But that's going to pose a problem for us. And this is the reason. The light of the world discourse is an argument. And I don't mean like an intellectual argument where Jesus is trying to make a point. I mean a voices raised, fists shaking in other people's faces argument. It's a confrontation between the good guys and the bad guys. And it's very, very explicit throughout the whole chapter. And so in order to have this apply to us, which I think it must, here it is, the eternal word of God, in red even, in the mouth of the Son of God, speaking not only, we must assume, to the Pharisees of the first century, but in some profound way to us as well. We have to be able to put into context why it is that he's having an argument. And why it is that his voice is raised every once in a while, so to speak. And that the language is confrontational. He's going to say something towards the end of chapter 8 about how our father is the devil. Or the people that he's talking to are sons of their father, the devil. And when they lie, they do what they were brought up to do because that's who they belong to. So it's a very confrontational language. And so on the one hand, we've got this assumption that Jesus, the Jesus that we've come to know and love in the gospel, is always speaking to us one way or another. And we also have come to assume that he's always speaking Words of love and mercy. I mean, I just got done saying, Jesus says to you today, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But it looks an awful lot in the rest of this passage, like he's saying, you sons of the devil. You sons of your father, the devil. So we have to figure out how to handle that. How is it that you're going to interpret Jesus condemning the Pharisees? For being sons of their father, the devil, in the rest of this passage. You know what's coming. I'm going to read it to you in a minute. One very common way is to say, thank God I'm not a Pharisee. Thank God I am not a member of that first century Jewish sect that was governed by legalism. And their only, their, their every waking thought was how to capture and kill Jesus of Nazareth. I would certainly know better than to join that club 
if I were living in the first century. And so Jesus, while condemning the Pharisees, doesn't condemn me. Because I wouldn't be in that group. Now, you know what I think about that. I probably mentioned it before, maybe even recently. That does us no good reading the New Testament that way. There's a profound sense in which we belong with those Pharisees. So I want to shun that direction. I want to encourage us somehow to put ourselves in the Pharisees' shoes and find a way to understand Jesus saying, you sons of your father, the devil, as being spoken to us in some productive way. Because I think everything else Jesus says in the New Testament is spoken to me in some productive way. This must also belong in that category. So how do we do it? Let me read the rest of the passage for today and give you kind of an idea of the difficulty that, I, that we find ourselves in. I'll start with verse 12, and we're going to go down to the end of verse 30. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, which, which pits him against all of his listeners and against us as his listeners in some profound way. How? Does it make you uncomfortable? To hear Jesus evaluating you like that? You are from below. I am from above. You know nothing about me or my father. What, what could he possibly mean? I want to go back to the beginning of the passage and just remind you that he begins by saying, I am the light of the world. This harkens back to the first chapter of John, right? Where John tells us the light came into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. The light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. It's a reference, of course, to, to the work of Jesus in the incarnation. What does light tell us about? It tells us about illumination, about understanding, about discernment, about clarity. In a previous chapter, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And in that metaphor, he said, I am here to 
feed your soul, right? Bread is for food. Bread is for nourishment and for sustenance. Here he says, I am the light of the world. What is light for? Well, not for food or sustenance so much as what? Understanding. Clarity, right? Something in the mind that you finally grasp because of the light. Something out in the open that used to be hidden and out of mind, but now it's front and center and clearly seen. Light explains. Light makes clear. Light lays out the situation so that it is unavoidable. It brings truth and makes it land. It's a mind-oriented thing, light, or at least it can be. And in this passage, Jesus takes the Pharisees, about whom more later, on a journey of illumination. This long, I am the light of the world discourse is an argument between Jesus and the Pharisees where they proceed from darkness and misunderstanding into illumination and clarity and understanding, from darkness into light, as Jesus, the light of the world, dawns upon them. And I want us to put ourselves in the situation of the Pharisees as we go through it. I want you to entertain for a moment the possibility, even now, that you might be mired in darkness, that you might not fully understand the message and the mission and the identity of the light of the world. Is it possible? Don't raise your hand. Is it possible, at least theoretically, that your understanding and grasp of the nature and message and mission of Jesus might be incomplete? Maybe there's a little darkness in with the light. If so, <laughs> Grant for just a moment that you might be sitting in the Pharisees' seat. And that the questions that John puts in their mouths might be questions that your own soul, your own mind, I could say, in this connection, has asked and is asking and will ask. So if you'll go with me that far, let's look at what the Pharisees do. What is their first objection? Why well, you didn't bring enough witnesses? Why should we believe you? They object to Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, and by the way, to everything he's ever said up until John 8, 12. I am the bread of life. I am one with the Father, etc., etc. They object to his testimony because of the legal procedure. Your testimony is not true because it has not been brought correctly. You need another witness. To which Jesus responds in a funny way. He says, my testimony is true, and by the way, this is in uh, verse number, hang on, uh, verse number 13, verse number 14, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. He says, my testimony is true because it points to actual truth. Regardless of the legal procedures surrounding testimony, I know what I'm talking about. I have seen with my own eyes, and I bear witness to what I have seen. And you, on the other hand, have not seen, and so you set up a system of verification by which to decide what is true. You rely on the rules and the procedures to decide what is true. The problem here is that you judge according to the flesh, verse 15. You try and fail to make sense of the world and to save yourself from it, and you rely on and even construct a system of verification that is not based on true knowledge. Is that ringing a bell with anybody? In the midst of your difficult circumstances, which you know have to be given to you by God in some real way, because you are, at least at the top level of your mind, believers, do you nevertheless say, how can I make sense of this world around me by erecting some sort of test? some sort of set of rules. If my circumstances meet this criteria or standard, I will conclude that the Lord is for me. 
If my circumstances look a certain way, I will conclude that the Lord's opinion of me or the Lord's word to me is thus and so. Jesus suggests that that system, represented here by the Pharisees saying, two or more witnesses or we're not going to believe you, is based on fundamental ignorance of the real situation. The path to understanding what God is doing in the world is not to look at our circumstances. You judge according to the flesh. You judge according to the flesh. Is God with you today? Is God for you today? No, he is not. How do you know? I have lots of ways to know. I have a whole big long list of circumstances and situations that prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is not for me. Carry around gigantic psychic dissonance in my head. I know theoretically that God is for me because the Bible tells me so. And yet, circumstance one, circumstance two, relationship one, relationship two, disaster, disaster, disaster. God is not bringing two witnesses. I only have one witness, some verse in the Old Testament that says God is for you. That is not two witnesses. Many, many witnesses are lining up on the other side. Their testimony is true because there's multiple examples of God being against me. You judge according to the flesh. The path to true illumination, to understanding the path of light, Jesus is suggesting, lies somewhere else besides evaluating our circumstances. I am the one who bears witness about myself, Jesus says. And what has Jesus said up until now? What has he said about himself? I am the bread of life. Anyone who feasts on my flesh and drinks my blood will have life in him. Anyone who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Right? I am the one who bears witness about myself. This is what I say about myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness about me at my baptism. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? That's only one voice, Jesus. Where is your father that we might interrogate him as well? And then this is where it gets troubling. Jesus says to them and to us, at least in some profound way that we have to admit and get our minds around you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus throws down a gauntlet here in the first part of this speech. You don't know anything rightly. This should be profoundly unsettling. If you wake up in the morning and walk out your front door, you know what you're pr primed and prepared to do because you are a human being with two eyes and a brain in your skull? Learn by experimentation about reality. And because you have a, two eyes and a brain in your skull, the way you're going to do that is you're going to interact with the world and draw conclusions about everything. And you're going to do it by gathering data, having relationships, going to your job, losing your job, whatever else it is. And you're going to draw conclusions from that data. And those conclusions are going to be built up naturally, automatically, instinctively by you into a structure that says this is reality. And you don't have a choice, really. Jesus is implying here. But to do that badly. Because there's something you don't know when you go about that, go about it that way. And if what you're looking for is an explanation, and we are, aren't we? Why? Why is my circumstance this way? Why does my life have these elements in it that I can't stand anymore? Jesus is saying, I am about to give you the mother of all explanations. I am the light of the world. I will explain everything. But this is not going to be the kind of explanation that you want. It's not going to be the explanation that you're looking for. 
because your utter ignorance of real truth will prevent that explanation from happening or landing in your head and your heart. You are ignorant in a profound way of the real source of truth in the world. Your recognizer is broken. Your recognizer is broken. When you are at, encounter adversity in your life, do you say, do you conclude God is against me? Do you recognize the opposition of God? Don't raise your hand. I already know. Because we all do, in one way or another. Is your first impulse to say, oh, God, the God of mercy just looks a little different than I assumed he would. Me, either. <laughs> that is not what we say. We say, I knew it! He hates me. Or, more to the point, I knew it. He's just not paying attention. He's not as concerned with me as I wish he were. His definition of what's good for me is different than mine, and he doesn't really care about mine. Missy was reading to me our new family devotional, which is the Sally Lloyd-Jones little kid book about the Old Testament. And there was a little story in there for children today about how many are the thoughts of God toward me. And she said to little children, she said, do you know how often God thinks of you? And then she started quoting from Psalm 139. 138 or whatever. The thoughts, oh, I don't even know the sum of your thoughts towards me. They're like the sand on the seashore. And then she says to the little kids, do you know that God thinks merciful and gracious thoughts about you all the time? So many that you could not even count them. God's attitude towards you is love, mercy, and constant attention. And he's always thinking about you and how to do you good. That's only one witness, though. It's just the Bible. And that 42 other witnesses say this life is a disaster. And each little tiny disaster is proof to me that it's not true. That God is ignoring, disregarding, or actively opposing me. Your recognizer is broken. Because Psalm 139 doesn't land in your heart and convince you of his goodness. And so the explanation that Jesus is about to offer is going to cross all of your assumptions. It's going to cross your assumptions because your utter ignorance of the real source of truth is always going to get in the way. And the explanation that he gives, the light of the world, the way he explains what's going on, comes in verse 21 and following. I am going away. And you will seek me, and you will die in your sin where I am going. You cannot come. This is the explanation offered by the light of the world in an effort to explain the real situation of your life and your sojourn on this earth. Where I am going. You cannot come. What? What does that mean? What is Jesus referring to right there when he says, where I am going, you cannot come? Earlier in the passage, he says, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. Do you know what he meant? When he says, I know where I came from, what does he mean? I came from heaven, right? I came from the Father. He said it several times in John up until now. I know where I'm going. What does he mean by that? Where is he going? Do you think the Pharisees knew what he meant? you think they guessed? Let's read. I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, was he going to kill himself? This is the, I'm, I'm reading right here. I'm not making this up. The Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says where I am going, you cannot come. What do they assume that he means? I am going to die. I am going to the underworld, to put it in ancient terminology. I am going down to the dead. And you cannot come there. Well, that's strange. We know that that's not true. We're all going to die. We're going to go there too, right? 
Here's the answer. Here's the answer. Here's the explanation by the, from the light of the world, explaining your situation to you. Where you are, where I am going, you cannot come. I am going to die. Pharisees say, that does not make sense. You're starting to talk like a crazy man. So he offers an explanation. Verse 23, he said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. <clears throat> unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I forgot to look up the uh, pronunciation of the two Greek words that are translated I am he in this verse, and so I'm not going to try and pronounce them because I can't remember but they are actually two words for a three-word English phrase. The three-word English phrase is, I am he. The two-word Greek phrase is, I am. There's no he in the Greek. Interesting. So Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Or, to incorporate what he has said in the sentences previously, Unless you believe that the I am will go to the dead, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am, who is from above, who is not of this world, will die, then you will die in your sins. Oh my goodness, you guys, here's the gospel, pure and simple, straight ahead for us. Here is the explanation. Here's the explanation from the light of the world. Where I am going, you cannot come. You cannot save yourself, even by dying, because you are from below. You cannot effect your own salvation in any way because you are of this world. In order for the salvation that my Father has planned to be effectual, he has to die himself. God himself, who is not of this world, who is from above, has to precede all his creatures into death. And in order for the deliverance to take place, they must put their faith and trust in him. Someone from above has to do it. God himself has to do it. And unless you believe, Jesus says, that I am that someone, you will die in your sins. That's very theological, but let's put it in terms of our own situations. Unless you believe in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your trouble, that Jesus has died to save you, and that his death and resurrection are the things that redeem your circumstances, then you will continue living the death that you're living right now, and the release and the joy of his salvation will be far from your heart unless you stay home, as it were, from the journey to death and to the underworld, and trust me to go there instead, you will die in your sins. It's hard for me to explain, in, I don't think I'm doing a very good job this morning, um, it's hard for me to explain how counterintuitive that is in our particular situations, because we all know this. This is not even interesting, it's so familiar. This is a Christian church, for goodness sake. We preach the gospel here. Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, so we don't have to do that by ourselves or for ourselves. We all know that. But here's the thing, we don't live it out on a regular basis. Because when trouble happens to us, at least when it happens to me, I pick up a hammer and go fix it. In my heart, not just in my circumstances, not just in my actions, but in my heart I say, this is one of the reasons I was so worn out this week. Here's the thing, and it's on me to do it. A new uh, situation presents itself in my life, that's one more thing for me to do. One more thing for me to find the resources to handle, lay out the resources to handle, make sure that the thing gets handled. 
And that, by the way, extends not just to physical circumstances, but the question of my salvation, the question of my relationship with God. I feel far away from God this week. Well, that's another thing I gotta handle. I gotta get back in the Word, right? I gotta get back to church. I've gotta somehow reconstruct my spiritual identity so that, fill in the blank, God will be pleased with me. Things will start going well for me with respect to God. The blessing from heaven will, be, will begin raining down upon me once more. It's another version of, I've got to live so that I can live. I've got to live so that I can live. I've got to rearrange and reformulate and recast so that I can live. Unless we trust Jesus to do that for us, that life that we're trying to build will be a death instead. It'll be a death instead. There is nothing like the fatigue, the spiritual fatigue that I struggle under when I am saving myself with my own energy. Rick, we saw each other last night. You said to me as you were leaving, you look a little tired. You had no idea. You had no idea. I was at the very, very bottom of spiritual energy, of personal energy. I was, I've been saving myself all day as hard as I could. And the result, I mean, to, not to put too fine a point on it, was death. Not physical death, but a walking experience of the opposite of spiritual life. There was no river flowing out of my heart. I've been working all day long to save myself, to, by my own exertions, carve out a place, in my own particular situation, carve out a place for rest. I just need some rest, I was thinking. I've got to make sure that I get, keep this time safe over here, or make sure I rearrange the circumstances so I can be alone for a minute, and get some rest for goodness sakes. Unless I can figure it out myself. I'm going to die, I thought. And Jesus comes and says, oh, no, no, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Unless you trust me to do the dying, unless you trust me to do the saving, then you will be on the outside looking in. And in this way, I'm in the Pharisee's seat. I respond to his every explanation. Wait, wait a minute. How can that be? That doesn't check out. Who's your father? The message of the gospel is too overwhelming to be easy. The message of the gospel is too complete to be obvious. It's a matter, as one of my favorite theologians, Gerhard Ferdi, says, it's a matter of death and life. Jesus dies, and we die in him to all of our attempts to save ourselves. And in return, because of his resurrection, we are raised to newness of life. And the affair of our salvation is handled. And with it, the affair of our lives on this earth in terms of our joy and our peace and our satisfaction and our rest. Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will show you how to get rest. Right? He doesn't say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you a secret technique <laughs> for guarding your weekend. Right? So Saturday morning is yours. And you can sit by yourself and recharge for goodness sakes. Come to me and I will give you the technique for that. No, no, no. He does not say that at all. I will give you rest myself. I am your rest. I am your rest. Learn from me. This is how I do it. And by the way, when he says learn from me, he doesn't, he's not talking about a technique. He's not talking about a technique. He's talking about understanding what it is that I have done. Learn what I have done for you. What have I done? Well, I have been gentle and lowly in heart. And I have meekly gone to death for your sake. And in my death, you will find rest for your soul. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you are perfectly at rest in your souls today? Me 
me either. No. Me either. I'm the Pharisee today. Who's your father? Who are you? They even say that when he says, uh, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So they said, well, who are you? By the way, has he said up until verse uh, 25, has he said I am before? Oh, yeah. Over and over. He's making it very, very plain for chapters now. Their, their journey towards enlightenment and the light of the gospel is not yet complete. I've been telling you from the beginning, he says. And yet, in verse 27, they did not understand that he was speaking about the Father. They did not yet understand. They completely missed it. Do we completely miss it? I just want to take the chance to encourage you today. To encourage you to see yourself as a blind Pharisee. Your problem is not that you haven't applied more assiduously the truth that you know. The problem is that you've forgotten it. You've forgotten it. I want to remind you again. The work that Jesus plans to do to save your soul and fill you with his spirit is finished. It was finished at the cross. And you are ready to live in his kingdom with joy and abandon. The more technique you have to apply, it's a matter of remembering. It's a matter of sitting in the light of the world, the explanation that Jesus offers. By the way, is there, is, are, is there hope for the Pharisee? Is there hope for the Pharisee in this passage? The Pharisee says, I am suspicious of this explanation that you're offering. It doesn't look like God should die. It doesn't look like vicarious atonement or vicarious salvation where you believe in somebody else's work. That's not how the world works. I saved myself. I figured it out myself. I don't buy it. Who are you anyway? Is there hope for a heart that responds that way? Is there hope for me because I respond that way? I got a good lever puller at the end of this arm. I know what to do. I can make good decisions and take on a lot of responsibility and discharge a lot of work. Is there hope for me? Look what Jesus says in verse 28. Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. It says, I am he. But the Greek is the same. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. What does that mean? What does lifted up the Son of Man mean? What's it a reference to? It's a reference to the crucifixion. Yeah? And by extension, the resurrection. It's a reference to the big event, the main event of Christian history. When that happens, you will know. Do you know what that is? That's a message of hope for the Pharisee. That's a message of hope for the Pharisee. They're having an argument. And what it's saying is you do not get it. You do not understand. In your heart of flesh, you are far away from me. But hang on. I'm going to convince you. I'm going to convince that wayward heart in your breast that I am. That the God who is from above, who is not from this, world, from this earth, is willing to die to make it all right. You will know that I and the Father are one. You will know in your circumstances that they actually point to my provision and mercy. You will know of my sovereignty that loves you in the midst of adversity, that even brings it for his good and merciful purposes. You will know that despite the fact that it feels like I am far away and that my back is turned, it's not true. That's a fault of your perception. You will know that as the resurrection works its work in your heart. You will know that though it feels like you're standing at square one of a ten-step process to sanctification and fulfillment, that in Jesus your sanctification is complete. And that the rest of your life can be filled with joyous response to his completed work. You don't feel that way right this minute. But as the resurrection 
works its work in your heart, you will know. The light of the world will shine on you. And you will understand. And you know how I know that's what he's saying? Because it worked in the moment. Look at verse 30. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Many who? Rick says, many Pharisees believed in him. Who else is he talking to? Those are, that's the audience, right? If John is a decent writer at all, he's going he's to keep the, the, the thing tight. He's not going to introduce new characters into the story, right? Let's go ahead and interpolate here. As he was saying these things, against and across and in the face of the Pharisees, many Pharisees believed in him. Why? Were they convinced by his argument? I don't think so. I don't think so. The light of the world dawned in their hearts. And because of God's gracious gift, they said, I believe he is. I believe he is the one who is sent from heaven to die in my place. Isn't that great news? Amen. What do you have to do to get in the way of that light? I don't know, just be reminded. Is it going to shine on you? Yes. Is it shining on you right now? I don't know. Should we say it again next week? Yes. What are the chances that hearing it every Sunday for the rest of your life is going to result in no illumination whatsoever? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The faithful God, the God of love and mercy, has gotten your number. And it doesn't matter that you are actually just as close-hearted and suspicious and legalistic and mechanistic as the worst Pharisee in this chapter. As a matter of fact, you might not hear this from every preacher you ever hear, Jesus came to save the Pharisees, of which I am the worst. And if he came to save the Pharisees, you're in good company. So hear it. Embrace it. My heart is suspicious. I am overwhelmed by my circumstances. They lead me to accuse you. You have not brought your evidence correctly. You have not brought enough witnesses. Who's your father? Who are you? Who do you think you are? If that is the actual cry of your heart, it's okay. He is expecting that. As a matter of fact, if you don't think that's the cry of your heart, maybe you should look harder. He's trying to dig that out of you today. That response to his unconditional offer of grace. The general response of the average Pharisee is, who do you think you are? That's not how this world works. And Jesus knows that's your answer. And he's trying to dig it out into the light so he can shine on it. And he can say, you will know. You will know. And we have something over these Pharisees of the first century because the resurrection hadn't actually happened then. What he was saying to them literally is, in a year and a half, you will know. What he says to us is, you can know right now. Go read it. Remember, I did die in your place and came back from the dead. And all is finished. So rejoice, you Pharisee. Rejoice, you Pharisee. I am he. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I pray that you would uh, convince us that you would shine the light of your Holy Spirit into our hearts and convince us, Lord, of, the, of our great need for your saving power. Convince us of our great need for your sustaining grace. And Lord, help us to recognize when we go to building our own identities, when we go to saving ourselves by pulling the levers of our world with our own hands, Help us to see, Lord, the suspicion that's worked into that response. I pray that you would give us rest from those labors, rest from that exertion, and that you would fill us with your love and your Holy Spirit so that we could be free to do everything you have planned for us to do with joy and abandon and peace. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.